Hello and welcome. Uh, before I begin, may I request a couple of things. May I request everyone to switch off their mobile phones or keep them in silent mode. And may I request people sitting at the back to please occupy seats in the front. We anticipate more people coming in once the classes are over at 6.30. So some of you at the back, if you could just occupy some seats at the front. Thank you. This is the this is the 25th lecture of the Faculty of Architecture uh, Alumni Association, and uh, we are very lucky to have Peter Scriver and Amit Srivastava giving this talk. India was one of the key sites of international architecture and design culture of the mid 20th century. Drawing from the new newly published book India: Modern Architectures in History, Peter Scriver and Amit Srivastava will explore. how the construction of modern india is however an unfinished project in architectural terms that began long before the independence of the modern state in 1947 and that continues amidst the complexities and contradictions of india's global interest dr peter scriver is a founding member of the center for asian and middle eastern architecture at the university of adelaide in australia and senior lecturer in architectural history and theory his previous books include colonial modernities building dwelling in architecture in british india and ceylon and after the masters contemporary indian architecture in fact i remember that when we were students studying here most of the books in the library were of the modern masters and after the masters was one of the few books on indian architecture after the masters Dr Amit Srivastava is also a senior lecturer in the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Architecture at the University of Adelaide who trained and previously practiced as an architect in India he is the joint author of the elements of modern architecture understanding contemporary buildings the lecture series is organized by the faculty of architecture alumni association and this year's lecture series is made possible through the generous support from symphony limited With that, I would like to welcome uh, Peter Scriver and Amit Srivastava to please give the talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, a great honor indeed to be back here at SEPT. And uh, as the introductory comments have indicated, I I uh, was rather shocked when preparing for this um, this little tour we're doing around India um, to talk about this new book to realize how long it is that I've actually been involved with this topic. So that uh, students, well, younger faculty in the room who were students were were the ones who <laughs> who who read my very um, naive but earnest uh, first contribution to this uh, field, which was published 25 years ago, uh, and actually researched uh, 30 years ago when I was living here in in Sept in the Commerce College uh, hostels as a as a guest of well uh, of Mr. Doshi underneath the the Jaipur. um the new jaipur project that was going up, si- up up upstairs in one of the sort of consultants place so vikram bhat and i one of the first alumni of this illustrious school uh had the chance to look at at uh, what was going on in the mid 80s for him it was it was coming back after the first part of his career to see what his colleagues were up to and uh you know have a have a look sideways or as he saw it sort of shoot from the hip and sort of see 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 what what we could or up in the way of a, of a critical discussion that that hadn't yet reached um the print literature in 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 book form at least at that stage and for me as a as a naive uh, greenhorn who who had just finished uh, as one of his students in the course at McGill uh who is frankly completely uh, sort of uninspired by what was going on in North America at the time I thought well India that I ha- had a chance to see as a traveler before Before I finished my architectural studies, I thought, well, that's where I want to go and find out what it means to be an architect in a place that seemed to me where it, it mattered, or where where it was clearly doing stuff that was uh, of, of interest. And through Vikram, as some of you will know, uh, in his minimum cost housing focus and the 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 tenets of of sustainability and and uh, social service and so social mission in architecture, which were 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 the building blocks of this institution and he he he'd really inspired in me that idea that this was uh, a a place to to seek a vocation so together we we uh 
looked on the side of his real work, which was looking at uh, sites and service projects ten years on and how they were coming up in the in the in the context in which other things like the Irania project in the, in the Doshioff and such were were beginning to emerge. All of that was happening, and we we began to look at the state of architecture then, uh, thirty years ago. So um, that made me. Uh, become uh, before my time, I guess, or before before I had really formed out what I really thought my career would be. It sort of catapulted me back into academics and uh, a career that that went on to graduate school and and other topics, which caused me to stand back and say, well, if I really want to talk critically about this stuff and and uh, and really understand it. And uh, then I, I really need to maybe become more of an historian at the same time. So uh, the long and short of it is that we're, we're, we've come back many years later, in this case, um, echoing or, or replicating that sort of pattern where a, a respected senior who, who'd come from India out into my world and brought me back into India as someone from out there who be came into this world in the 1980s, I went back out into the world which the course of time took me to Australia, which seemed to be more interested in what I had to say in my second stage of work as a, as a, a PhD scholar looking at, at the, the bigger colonial modern picture, as I now call it, of, of, of development in this part of the world. Uh, that was something that resonated with issues that my generation of scholars in, in Australia were beginning to ask, and uh, I found a new home there and eventually attracted my brilliant younger colleague beside me here, Amit Srivastava, who came to do a PhD with me some little while ago, too. He's a bit shocked to realize that it wasn't yesterday either. And now uh, I'm very happy to say that he did brilliantly on, on that topic and, and has, has now become my boss. He runs the program that in which I teach and uh, is a colleague and, 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 a, and a genuine peer. So the happy story is that when I was invited by uh, Reaction Books, uh, the, the British publisher that's been doing this uh, series for the last uh, few years um, called Re uh, Modern Architectures in History, it struck me as an opportunity to, to revisit something that I thought, well, maybe I've done enough on that or I shouldn't offer any more of my comments on that. But uh, it was a chance to, to, to write a, a, a new history, certainly not the history, um, a history with with uh, even more depth, and I'm looking at Madhavi Desai in front of me here, who's clearly had a serious go at that with uh, now, I mean, dare I say, almost 20 years ago, with John Lang and 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 Mickey Desai, uh, who 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 gave us certainly on top of the the, the sort of thin critical first uh, take that Vikram and I did in the 1980s, uh, in the 1990s, we had their thick slab, which did take us back to the 19th century, which did tell us uh, ma a many-faceted view of the, particularly the question of independence and identity in, in the search for an Indian architecture. I thought that writing a, a new history with yet another two decades, well, by when I began, it wasn't quite two decades, but with, the, with more than another decade of distance from the, the previous major attempt well into the 21st century, that I could really take on this question of modern and India and architecture with a, with a, a very long view, uh, where I could put together the, the two bodies of my previous work, the kind of the critical look at the later 20th century and the, the, uh, the historical work on the late 19th century, and, and offer an argument uh, that uh, to really understand or to think thickly and, and critically and, and usefully about uh, what, is, what is modern and, and what is the role of the built environment in shaping modern India as one of the most important places on earth, uh, we, we ought to at least take in that longer view. So we, I, I embarked actually, uh, solely into this project uh, when, when, when invited into the stable of this uh, series of books that we're attempting to write about modern architecture as a something that we could now look at in the frame of history uh, in its plurality. I mean, the, 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 the S is intentional in the subtitle, and the, the series of books have, have all been commissioned to experts of one sort or another who can write from the position of, of a particular point in the globe uh, towards the subject. So uh, th that was a daunting commission that I labored on 
um, solely for uh, the, the well, uh, Ahmet was uh, was laboring in the fields of a, his own PhD thesis uh, to the point that he'd finished that piece of work that some of you in the room met him uh, in the context of uh, some time before when he was trying to revisit that famous dialogue with uh, Khan and his brick here in the backyard of Sept uh, over at the IAM campus and, and, and put that into a, a really brilliant piece of work that looked at the ontology of the, the of materials, really, uh, uh, the, the, the took seriously the proposition that materials in architecture might actually speak. Um, we can have he can have discussions with you that, that outside the talk of uh, this discussion later. But it, it in bringing him into the archival materials again to do with Khan and finding new ways of of bringing uh, perspective to that uh, that trove of, of of insight into the question of architecture in this place. Uh, I, I thought that it was high time that I had a younger voice in the the team, um, as I mentioned earlier, replicating the the kind of the the, the opportunity I was given uh, and that I gratefully uh, appreciated to to come into this space. I invited Ahmet to to become part of my team, and I, what I hope has made a, a much a much better, a much finer, um, a much more useful discussion out of this effort at writing a history, which is really the product of our critical dialogue between ourselves and particularly as it comes forward to the to the challenging the fascinating the uh, the the big question of, of, of what the recent past and and the present uh, mean for the, for the discipline of architecture here in India and as I mentioned before I think the world is is watching India more and more so this not for the first time as we'll argue in our subsequent presentation here is a place that the world watches to understand what architecture is and could be and should be. So with those uh, long <laughs> introductory remarks and again emphasis of thanks to those in the room who, who have met me before and the hope that some I haven't met before will uh, be inspired to, to think that history is actually cool and worth listening to an old guy and a younger guy with uh, even less hair than the old guy. Um, uh, for the next hour or less, um, I'll hand over to Ahmet to take us to the present, where hist which is what history is all about. Well, um, Peter's given a pretty long introduction to where this book comes from, but I think uh, a small little bit that I wanted to add to this was um, the idea that a historian's task is a sort of difficult one, um, and it's a slightly lonely one sometimes. Um, so we've had the two of us <laughs> debating a lot of these things, and when you're in the final stages of producing something like this, and we've been working on this book now for eight years, um, you do try to cut yourself off a little bit from incoming new information because you want to digest what you have and get a critical view on it. So I think uh, before we sort of start off with the details of today's presentation, the only thing I would like to add, especially for the students in the room, is that uh, this is now by no means uh, an opportunity for just to us for us to come and give you a lecture on history, uh, but to sort of say, well, this is an ongoing project and it has only been possible today because of the involvement of a lot of people who've done small bits of work, and we want to reinitiate those that dialogue with this process and take the process of writing about India and modern India and its construction history. Uh, to whatever the, the new world requires, whether it's new mediums, uh, you know, new languages, uh, and become part of that uh, discussion again. So this particular lecture is also an opportunity for us to come back into the, into the field and start that dialogue again. So we'll return to those thoughts uh, later. I just um, wanted to sort of pick up on what Peter said in the end, where he said, um, well, history is all about the present, and uh, we've had a chance to speak to a lot of students around India on this trip, and I think one of the most important things that sort of pops up into a student's mind is, well, why are we listening more about what happened in the 50s and 60s, and how is that relevant to what I need to know today, to what do I need to do tomorrow? So for the purpose of the presentation, uh, which is clearly not how it is framed in the book, we start uh, from the present day, and we start to try and understand why, why is it worthwhile for us to look at a history of modern architecture in India, and to possibly look at this extremely long take on the history of modern architecture of India, where the book starts um, in 1855, all the way till now. Um, so 
of course, we are all aware of the great political rhetoric that is surrounding us right now uh, with India facing this grand moment of development, of change that's happening, uh, a whole series of smart cities and, uh, and uh, important construction-related, infrastructure-related work that's going to happen in the future. And as architects, we will be part of this future um, one way or the other, whether we become part of the teams that build these things or we become part of the resistance that figures out what the problems with these lofty new ideals are. But um, I want to sort of quickly go back to how this rhetoric takes uh, on the public imagination quite so easily uh, is to sort of say, well, this image that you see on the right with the whole Make in India sort of campaign and the, the smart cities and the glitzy buildings uh, that come out of this in terms of the imagery of our architecture that it will produce is an obvious, uh, or at least in, in terms of the rhetoric, an obvious outcome of a story that kind of started two decades ago, where India seemingly found uh, its moment in the world economic stage after the liberalization and uh, the rise of the IT sector to a certain stage. And we realized since the 90s, we've had that sort of uh, patronage of the IT companies for both international and local architects to do fantastic large-scale works, uh, which have become iconic and tend to sort of beg the question of what it means to be in India now in this particular moment uh, with its capacities to build extensively on large scale and uh, you know, not, not being behind anybody else in the world. So it's a, it's a great moment uh, and it's a, it's a great story and there's no reason why people won't lap it up. Okay? <laughs> but um, as historians, uh, we... No, we're not, we're not such nice players and we try to mess things up a little bit so we look back and say, well, what's wrong with this story? Um, and why don't we want to buy into it just quite as easily as everybody else does? So we just want to return back uh, to that same moment in the early mid-90s. I must sort of also remind that um, architecture in this whole thing has uh, a very interesting and very important role to play. In the first bit you saw architecture being used uh, as part of the symbolic story of development, sort of saying, well, if we are developing and we are economically prosperous, we make tall, glitzy buildings that rival everything else in the world. But politics hasn't used architecture for the first time. It continues to use architecture in different ways to serve its different purpose. Early mid-90s, we were aware of the, the Ram Janbhumi and Babri Masjid issue. And that's a really interesting example of how architecture, uh, that simple model that's been paraded around uh, a million times around different parts of the country um, with you know, very passionate people behind it, um, use that architecture as a symbol for a particular way of thinking about what this nation is about and what the people want. And that model, that symbolic expression of architecture becomes a way to sort of capture public imagination and for the politicians to say, well, exactly, this is what India needs to be and we will provide you this by making these buildings. So this is another way that architecture is taking on that symbolic role. That particular example is also important for us in terms of the book because um, by the time we were coming to the 90s and, and it becomes particularly difficult from a historian's perspective trying to write that long history to say something meaningful about something that is so close and uh, run the risk of you know, being um, told that you're wrong maybe a few days later when everything else changes. So, the 1990s was an important time for us to write about modern architecture in India. We said, well, that particular case uh, raises this particular issue with uh, the publication of Habib Rahman's proposal for the Ayodhya site in, 19, in the 90s uh, in a newspaper, and that's the drawing that he sent through as part of a letter to editor, where he proposed um, to resolve this problem, as he, as he would say, uh, of the Babri Masjid Ramjan Bhumi issue, to resolve this problem, he, he used architecture again to, as a problem solver, that he is a modernist, uh, using architecture for that problem solving. He proposes a center for comparative uh, religious studies, uh, which include in this sort of very um, basic uh, and very exposed sort of structural system, uh, the forms of the mosque and the shikara and, and you know, puts them all together uh, to sort of say, well, architecture is a solution, but not that sort of architecture, the one that's on the top. This is the solution that we need for the problems <coughs> that our country is facing right now. So first thing here is to sort of recognize that architecture is an important part of the story and, you know, it is an important part of the politics of, the, of uh, whatever context we set this thing in, but also the fact that 
in the 90s with this particular case, we find that this becomes a sort of battleground for modern architecture, which is what it's saying that we will not be, uh, we'll just not slip into the background and sort of uh, be denied our existence by the arrival of this new presentation of architecture there, but we will fight this uh, and try to say that the problems of this country can still be solved through architecture. Uh, with that uh, sort of set up for where we want to take this story, we will step back a little bit and I'll ask Peter to now talk about an earlier moment of this thing, of this sort of symbolic power of architecture as part of the central government's rhetoric um, with the arrival of the independence. So, of course, uh, we think we know the 1950s. Um, uh, we think that's the obvious grand narrative about, about India and its arrival into modernism. Uh, perhaps uh, conspicuously, we haven't we haven't actually represented any of the iconic buildings of Chandigarh, which is uh, what we acknowledge in our introductory part of the book. As you know, inevitably we must address the uh, the phenomenon of Chandigarh, not because it's dismissible, but because it it uh, is inevitable. But it our goal is to is to put it in its place. To to and in the relevant chapter, we 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 certainly discuss it, but. This chapter, in the uh, beginning with the the independence of India in 1947, is is about the the aspiration to uh, to, to course build the architecture of a new nation, but particularly with a focus of architecture in the in the service of that national ideal, and particularly in the service of the government. So the the young the younger architect we see on the left is the same we saw at the end of our book, uh, Habib Rahman. Uh, here captured in, a, in one of the, 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 the gems of, of the, what we believe are previously unpublished photographs and, and, and images we've, we've, we've been happy to, to find in the course of doing this book, in this case through our access to, the, to his private archive and a handful of others which, which have allowed us to, to open the book on, on a, uh, a, another way of understanding the story again as, as we think we know. So looking from inside the, the, the the, the Central Public Works Department. The, the first image is actually Habib uh, in the, the West Bengal Public Works Department in his first, his first uh, stage of his career, just having returned from his uh, important studies overseas in, in, in the, the, uh, the light of, of many luminaries of the modernist movement, uh, bringing that enthusiasm into the, his ambitions for, for serving the government in this a secular modernist uh, ideal, which was very much th that of the Nehruvian state. But what we, what we're showing in, in these these particular selection of images here, um, is again that focus uh, certainly embodied in in what, what we've learned about this particular uh, individual um, uh, from his the record of his work, but also some interviews I was fortunate to have with him many years ago. Uh, before he died, uh, to understand that 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 passion really to solve the problem, what as it was perceived to be, of building housing, which is sort of one of the largest and most emphatic sort of uh, body of evidence that we're looking at here, uh, to extend those solutions to the the planning of of entire sectors and and uh, cities, ultimately as as a sort of a natural extension of what the vocation of this generation of architects imagine. Uh, born in the in the uh, in the vocation of of, of being a, a modernist, um, but this is also the the the, the, the uh, an iteration of of what Amit's already begun to to, st to sketch out a, a one thread of this 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 argument in in our sort of tapestry like history, which is the that of the the drawing to the to the center. In this case, the drawing of that particular architect from the from the the provinces from West Bengal within the first five years of his career to the Central Public Works Department, where he rises uh, eventually to become the chief architect and, and produces a, a very important body of work. Um, of course, with in collaboration with a large number of colleagues, working centrally to 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 uh, exude and. Um, and uh, inspire or draw together a, 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 a body of, of central uh, government buildings across the, the whole country eventually that, that, that are part of this, this, uh, 
this ambition, this this vision of a, of a coordinated um, rationalization of the problem of, of building the new, essentially socialistically minded nation. We contrast this um, this version of seeing the the the, the, the building of modern interest in India, the constructing of the of the of the the, the modernist ideals of the moment with the um, the counterpoint, which in, in a subsequent chapter we, we look at much the same period of time from the point of view, not least of course, of, of Ahmedabad um, and um, a number of other uh, more and less uh, obscure, um, and, uh, not obscure, but some, some much more obscure or, or less well-known provincial points on the map um, through the, the, the recognition when we begin to take a, a more coordinated or, or comprehensive uh, historical view at, across this time at these oft-discussed differences and, and, uh, you know, and, and the, the kind of emergence of this, this curious axis of, of, of richness and, and dominance in the architectural scene between sort of Delhi and, and, and Ahmedabad and, and Mumbai almost as sort of a secondary emanation to, to, to what was going on in Ahmedabad. We began to see that pattern occurring in, in smaller, less, less understood ways in, in other parts of the country and even within Delhi and other places we thought we know when we look at the work of Stein, for instance, and, um, or, or we go to the provinces and we look up on the left there at, uh, at uh, the, the Bits Palani um, campus as it was emerging in the, in the 1950s. Um, this is a story of institution building. Um, and the the ambitions of of a modernist elite, which um, uh, which is, includes industrialists and, and intellectuals and uh, financiers um, of various sorts, who who uh, are creating uh, a, a parallel uh, idea of, of modern India. But very importantly, when we begin to understand deeper into their institutional and corporate histories and such that. Um, very often it involves uh, very important international uh, linkages which are bypassing or independently establishing a, a very cosmopolitan worldly networks uh, which are quite independent, quite powerfully independent of, of the central government, um, uh, the Nehru and, and, and subsequent governments' uh, designs and, and, and networks. Yeah, so there's this, this fascinating what's sometimes seen as sort of a critical resistance or cultural resistance, but it's also a political and, and sort of economic autonomy that's going on. It's, again, some of these sound obvious, but I think when you look at, at, uh, at it historically, it's, it's a fascinating pattern of, 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 uh, of alternative stories uh, that uh, the buildings begin to tell, tell the story of. And uh, as we know, you know, again, very richly in the case of Ahmedabad, this, this, this is this, this uh, this story is well known, but the the uh, the comparable stories that we can tell and we, we now can tell better in, in some of the other parts of the country are make for a really uh, rich counterpoint to to the the standard grand narrative of this period. I'm going to hand back to Amit to take us to sort of the third point of this argument. I think um, there's a few things we are claiming to establish the first of course architecture matters um, and not only in terms of the iconic buildings that we saw in the first couple of slides but also in the, the problem solving um, pattern work of the let's say the PWD and the housing and all of that and how that sort of reflects a connection to the political ideals and the work of institutions and individuals. Um, but the second thing that is now starting to emerge uh, or has been part of this sort of story for a long time, which was available to me when I was a student here studying architecture, uh, is that story which we often look at from the independence onwards in the 50s and 60s, and that part of the story is well established, as uh, this sort of dichotomous position between the center in the 50s, sort of deciding what the center in the CPWD and the government has to do to you know, build the country, nation building, uh, versus this sort of uh, not an obvious dissent, but a desire for the regions to establish themselves as these cosmopolitan sort of centers that Peter mentioned, uh, Ahmedabad being a very important case in that, but multiple others where the regional elite are part of the institution building process. So we have this sort of obvious story that is coming up and a lot of histories tend to take on that position and run with it. And one of the things that uh, happen when trying to write a long history is that we 
realized that well that was not enough and this two-part process of going back and forth between the center and region might not be the complete story and um, the bit where this becomes most evident is the the story of the 70s which he thought was quite interesting mostly because it is something that uh, history books have kind of skipped over or have only told in patchy bits and this is one of the things that we try to do we want to talk about the story of the 70s um, it is, was an interesting point in the history of India politically and uh, for the younger people in the audience who might not sort of remember all of that uh, or uh, might not have recently read about it of course since the end of the Nehruvian period in mid 60s there was a little bit of a political issue that was going on in terms of leadership until the arrival of Indira Gandhi and uh, the Bangladesh um, the, the, the war that happened uh, with the liberation of Bangladesh the early 70s and by mid 70s we are in another very important period with the emergency and and all the media blackouts and the, imp the implications of that are India's uh, relationship with the outside world arrival of yet another set of governments by late 70s which fails to keep on with their mandate and the the rise of the Hindu right and then again the arrival of Indira Gandhi so it's a very sort of important uh, decade packed with a lot of important political issues and continuously challenging the relationships with India with the outside world as well but what we found uh, in this trying to write the longer history is this there's a re it is a really important moment for architecture uh, where it is forced in a way to consolidate the two positions that have been before the mandate of the center to build uh, the nation and the regional desires to build individual um, ideas that represent themselves in their direct relationship with the outside world through an internationalization and this sort of uh, this idea of indigeneity in terms of modern architecture is what we quite interested in where we start seeing some of these processes uh, being reflected through the idiom of modern architecture now leading to what we would define more clearly as an associated modern you know the part of the architect modern architectures um, so a quick couple of examples that we've got there so at the bottom you've got uh, Kanvinde's Dudsagar dairy complex in Mesana where we're quite interested in of course Kanvinde's own um, training and his pedigree as a modernist uh, in terms of its architecture but the fact that it that that particular building is part of the story of the white revolution and the implications of that cooperative model that became something that India could offer to the rest of the world in in the particular 70s context of development so it's a really interesting sort of uh, confluence of the two bits and we start looking for examples like this particularly in the 70s where we can say that the modern architecture is being absorbed as part of the indigenous uh, developments um, the top left one is of course the particularly interesting story of Oroville uh, which of course comes a couple of times in the book but here uh, here we are also interested in the idea of the export the cultural export of India to the rest of the world the 60s and you know the the impact on the hippies and all the stuff that we've probably heard about before uh, but also something that we are starting to recognize now 50 years uh, on as something that India has offered to the world uh, and especially with the establishment now of the Ministry of Yoga I believe we have and we're starting to think about how these sort of cultural exports are also part of how India is connected to the to the rest of the world so architecture is becoming then mixed with these sort of uh, cultural spiritual ideas uh, which define how modern architecture is appropriated within the Indian context and of course I'm not going to get into too much detail but the work that is being done as part of um, Indira Gandhi's mandate to deal with uh, poverty as an issue around the country and the work of groups like Greha which are starting to rethink the issue of housing and the architects involvement in that sort of story so of course we try to fill in that sort of part of the 70s but what we are more interested in here is the fact that we are starting to look over a longer history term a pattern of not just this sort of dichotomous position between the center and the region but the fact that the consolidation of these two positions then allows for a third sort of indigenous form of modern architecture to emerge which is what we hope to find in other sets of time as well so with that I think we're going to jump back now all the way to 1855 uh, which is really where the book starts um, in to try and talk about a similar sort of patterning over the 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 colonial modern period uh, with the arrival of the PWD and the Indian independence movement so I think oh, sorry 
1855 was uh, the actual year in which the, the public works department system we know today uh, was given a formal birth that officially had emerged out of the, the military works departments of the, of the British, uh, of the, the, the company army. And uh, though, as you know, this was two years before uh, the rebellion and the the, uh, the transformation of the of that enterprise into a, a, a crown undertaking as as truly responsible uh, government uh, of an official sort of colonial regime. It was really the 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 precursor to the to the to the waking up and the shock of of, of that military engagement that 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 was uh, that of a government taking responsibility and building. Building the organizing the built environment was was something that even before the, the, the company's regime had, had finally finished, they realized they, they needed to do to consolidate this very ad hoc um, uh, acquisition, this vast and, and ultimately highly cherished political acquisition of the of the uh, of the, the South Indian subcontinent of, uh, of the South Asian subcontinent as uh, Britain, as you know, Britain's most prized possession. So. We tell the story from this point forward as, as the first iteration of this centralizing uh, approach to the to the building of, a, of what was a highly conscious modern building exercise, building modern buildings, building modern uh, infrastructure to uh, enable a very self-consciously thinking modern state uh, governing exercise to to, to actually maintain its grip and, and do its duty to some degree to uh, certainly its own people and those people upon of course it, it relied massively who were the, the 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 rapidly growing armies of of uh, Indian subordinate uh, employees and and government servants that needed to be housed needed to be uh, uh, contained in terms of uh, does this work here. That one. So, oh, now I've gone. <laughs> the, that's it, this one. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, of course, we had we had prisons. We had housing for military officers of various sorts. We had housing for railway workers. Uh, one of the, the cases that uh, I would particularly have written about before and particularly interested in this. This is non-military, sort of paramilitary type of organization of the of the te technological infrastructure and all of the social space and and uh, human capital that was involved in in running this this as I again emphasize this highly modern enterprise. When we come to the to the urban planning uh, again, as uh, I'm certainly not the first person to write about, but uh, it's very important in my in, in the earlier work that's reflected in this history of ours uh, that I and my generation of post-colonial scholars have been doing the the, uh, the the contrast between the the old urbanism and the the, the cantonments and civil lines that we uh, we and we see here in Amdabad and so many other uh, classic uh, versions of the pattern are, 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 are the template for the modern cities that we know in Europe after the Second World War, that we, we know throughout the world as the contrast between modernity and tradition. And that the, the, uh, these are part of the argument that, again, my generation of post-colonial scholars has, has made about India being one of the most important laboratories for many of the social engineering experiments. Uh, not explored not least through uh, physical design, through physical planning, uh, through typologies like this, uh, ex these extraordinary uh, railway workers' quarters in Ajmer, which are among the thousands or tens of thousands one finds around the country, made of concrete in the 1870s and 80s, you know, uh, a century before, almost a century before we saw the same typologies emerging in, in Chandigarh. Um, I'll among many other things that we dwell in in this early part of the book, of course, is attention to climate and to, to building an environment that was salubrious or, or habitable and that addressed through the, the scientific knowledge of the time uh, the questions of public health and, and, and well-being. Uh, again, this is all something we know, but when we look at it um, in this sort of coordinated way and, and emphasize that this, this, was, this was part of, you know, an, obvious, an obvious part of the, the modern architectural history,
of this part of the world, I, th I think this, this uh, is where we naturally begin. And also begin that argument that this is also about rationalizing the, the question of the built environment as a, as a centralized exercise through the, the agency, as it was, of, of this, this rapidly ramifying public works system and its, its, its uh, sort of natural inclination to solve a problem and then standardize the solution to maintain the efficiency and economy in a corporate uh, 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 corporate sort of system sense to, to not repeat, repeatedly uh, reinvent the wheel. We see the, the origins of other things that ultimately become uh, problems that 20th century architects often resist um, and are resisted before, long before the independence in the, in the emerging pattern of, of, of regional digression uh, or aspiration naturally enough to, to do architecture in, in different ways than the, than the public work system. So the, the story of the emergence of a profession, uh, again, Madhavi and, and Lang and, and, uh, have, um, have given us, uh, among other scholars, quite a bit of insight into aspects of the, the origin of the profession. Here again, we look at it as a, as a thread emerging out of this, this, this public works history the, the, the dependence, the, the need to create architectural education to, to serve the government's purpose at the beginning of the century, um, it's, it's, a, it's an institutionalization in the, in the JJ school in, in, in Bombay, but also become, becomes, by that method, uh, or by that, that route, a beginning of this, this uh, you know, sort of regional differentiation uh, that uh, we, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we, we see in the, in the story of modernity in, in a new key that, uh, again, we know well in the case of, of, of Bombay. We, we explore in our book um, the, the interesting uh, competition and differences between the, the metropolis of Bombay and, and Calcutta uh, with their different art and design scenes and ultimately their, their, uh, their, the, the role uh, that both of those scenes uh, ultimately sort of feed back into the into the, the emerging independence movement. So uh, the, the story, uh, here we see the, the plan that you know well of the, the Sabarmati Ashram here, um, the, the, the intimate connections between the, the, the freedom struggle um, and the industrialists and, and elites who, who are also part of these, these uh, emerging uh, r regional uh, scenes of uh, of difference in the, on the different poles of the country is, is part of our story, part of that recurring narrative. But uh, to look, uh, as we do again, um, at the at the radical modernity of of that plan, um, and to realize how vernacular and the seemingly non-modern uh, gestures were were, were so um, so powerful powerful uses of, of architecture for political purposes. Um, and also for some uh, symbolic purpose, of course, but also as, as actual practical devices for shaping social practice um, in the case of Gandhi and his ashram and by, re by example, many others to, 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 uh, to actually engineer new ways of, of imagining one, the way one would live in, in the India of the future are, are part of this complicated um, set of, of uh, threads through which we look at the, uh, the emergence of of the the modern colonial state in, by the mid 20th century. I'm going to hand back to Amit to take us uh, fast forward to the end of our story. I think that's um, it's been a long journey into the long history that we've been looking at. But the purpose of that, now returning to the beginning of the talk, is to sort of say, well, maybe it allows us to understand some sort of pattern in terms of uh, historical development and see our position right now over the last couple of decades in a slightly different light uh, and position ourselves better with what this means for the future. With this slide, uh, what we want to do is we want to say, well, the, the stories that we said we told for the last couple of decades since the 90s, we want to um, position, position that in relation to just a slightly bigger cycle and we go back all the way to the 80s um, where we see the arrival of a new Indira Gandhi and a new sort of mandate um, and a lot of focus on defining very strongly from the center a symbolic version of what it means to be Indian or the idea of Indianness is and um, as the commemorative stamps on the top left hand corner 
uh, relate, which is Russian stamps um, commemorating the festivals of India. So the 1980s becomes an important time where a lot of this rhetoric is coming out of the center with the establishment of the festivals of India. And the festivals of India are a good uh, or important marker to consider in terms of what the architectural community or how the architectural community is responding to this um, requirement set up by the center is um, the fact that you know important architects including people like Korea and Raval are directly involved in establishing what the exhibition is about and how they can frame uh, this idea of Indianness in terms of architecture and the, the longer history of India. And we see impacts of that in terms of the work of people over the 80s including those um, famous modernist architects like Korea themselves whose JKK plan is down there which starts referring back to this new notions of mandala and you know, things that have not been initially part of his vocabulary now start entering his vocabulary and, and get subsumed in this new dialogue that he's creating. We also see um, as in the on the left hand side Ralph Lerner's winning entry for IGNCA uh, a need also to respond to the colonial heritage so things that are closer in terms of history to now generate a longer term idea of what Indianness is and how architecture needs to respond. So again, we see the connection with the politics in the center. We see a connection and need for architecture to uh, respond to this from a symbolic perspective. And um, we, it leads to this particular type of architecture that is developing in the 80s and this focus on symbolism and the notion of Indianness. <coughs> so what we are now sort of saying, and of course, uh, as historians, we've already sort of claimed in trying to long, trying to write the long history, we are not particularly well versed in making a position about the last couple of decades and uh, definitively saying what has happened or might happen in the future. But we are saying, well, how can we understand the the last couple of decades now in opposition to that? So if that was the question of identity set up by the center, how have we changed over the last couple of decades? And for us, it still remains a question mark. And the rest of the presentation, as in the book, sort of puts forward a couple of propositions uh, which are not the definitive answer to that but we say that might be a way to look at it uh, and we open those up to you for scrutiny and for further discussion. So one of the obvious ways uh, we can try and resolve this is by saying well in, in, in addition to the sort of global India since the 90s that we've sort of seen with the, the star architects doing their big glitzy work. Um, we have also these regional cosmopolitans and previously as we talked about regional descents and regional patterns maybe the examples and these a lot of this sort of come up in uh, recent publications so works of people like Aniket Bhagwat, Rahul Mehrotra who's already uh, currently in Mumbai organizing the state of architecture exhibition and also we've been hearing a lot more in the media about Studio Mumbai especially since the involvement with the Venice Biennale, the outside world, is started to look at these regional examples. Uh, so these practitioners who are working for um, either individual wealthy clients or sometimes NGOs, uh, they might be a form of regional descent that we are looking at. And to a certain extent, that is the story that we hear. But the other end of this is, and we are quite conscious of this, is being very, very current, uh, mostly because this we, uh, as the book was going into print, uh, that's when the Modi government came into the center and we got a chance at the last moment to sort of insert a few comments about what we thought that particular moment meant. And um, our proposition in the book was to sort of look at this uh, shift as an important shift, maybe in that cycle that we were talking about with the center and the region and then a consolidation that might happen and uh, particularly with when we hear a lot more about the Gujarat model, now a regional model now being uh, taken to the center to be applied for the rest of the world or being seen as a model for the rest of, the, sorry, rest of India, uh, we start wondering if that might be the point of change where those regional and central voices are now going to be consolidated into something that becomes part of what India needs to do. And of course that means big um, infrastructure projects that we are already aware of, which is happening in your backyard. Uh, but we are also interested in uh, how this might impact or create other forms of architectural iterations of uh, ha uh, a modernist language. And we have taken an example here, which is Gurjit Mathru's work for the Ashwini Kumar Crematorium, where we can see, of course, the, the, the idiom, the modernist idiom and the use of concrete and the forms which reflect that, uh, the continuation of that language. Uh, but on the other hand, we are also aware that 
this is a, a piece of very basic infrastructure deeply connected to an Indian way of life. It's a crematorium on the sides of the guard. So we start seeing in this kind of project, and of course this is almost like a poetic last word for the book, where we are saying, well, maybe this is what we are trying to look for, a combination of this language or idiom of modern architecture, but deeply connected to the requirements and needs of infrastructure that India has right now to create some sort of a consolidated next phase of modern architecture. Now, um, if Peter wanted to add a couple of words about that last project before we sort of wrap this up and open up for questions. I think I will. Uh, the, the, the risk is that I will go on too long, but uh, and Amit's very good at keeping me in control. Um, uh, I think this really is a, a, an important uh, project. I haven't yet actually seen uh, Gurjit Singh's work, um, but I've seen it published, uh, and, and others have obviously responded to, to its power. Um, how could we end this book? Uh, Amit's explained. I think I wa in, in testing out this, um, this idea in the last few days with other student audiences particularly, um, and young academics and, and professionals and such we've been talking with, we've been sort of sensing this, 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 this note of despair um, uh, among many, many professionals in particular that, that the, the discipline is, 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 is almost at risk of being bypassed by this, this whole thing we're, we're, we're addressing, this, this whole uh, great leap forward to the the, the smart cities and uh, what to me at a distance sound like wow bonanza of opportunity for architecture but but the the, the fear or the sense is that architecture is, is still under misunderstood not understood at all by the by the political culture um, and and the money culture and, and so that it gets reduced to perhaps just a, a, a tiny bit of the rhetoric, to use a word that we, we, I wanted to emphasize more clearly er, earlier on, the fact that we've been looking not just at, at center versus periphery or regionalism versus governmentalism or something, we've been looking at rhetorical function of architecture versus the, the kind of rationalizing function, the, the, the reasoning, problem-solving part of functioning and uh, of architecture. and. This this scheme of Gurdjieff Singh Mataru's uh, is is a perfect fusion of these two things. It, it is, if anything, nothing but a, 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 a conduit, a vessel through which ashes can flow. Um, it's part of the riverbank. It's um, it's a it's a it's a purely functional uh, piece of very bold modernist architecture. But it is. Profoundly, I mean, both nostalgic and heroic uh, in its its statement about its its regional pedigree here as part of the the mid 20th century architectural language of this place of, of this part of the country, uh, and it's it's this part of the world that that kind of gave this language to the world through the through the work of 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 the architects of that time and of course. Or but but uh, the 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 world of work that 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 he found here in himself. So it, it's this it's this that 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 tension between the the, the rhetoric and the, and the kind of the the problem solving, the reason, the rationalizing aspect of architecture. To so to come back to my point about the despair that students in particular are expressing to us. You know what are we going to do if they really sort of are worried about it? But if they don't just want to be a fashion artist who's going to dress some buildings, some 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 boxes produced by someone else with with something uh, iconic, is that these works, these two works, I mean, Bimal sitting right there, who's built this extraordinary infrastructure um, that's changed this city um, profoundly, and and this this minor, but uh, equally sort of earnest and important piece of infrastructure in Surat. These are both infrastructures that are built by architects, that are designed by architects, uh, where presumably you are in control. Uh, you are the center of the creative process, and you're engaged in in really uh, in doing real stuff, real stuff that matters. So uh, we were happy. I was happy to sort of see that. Uh, though uh, certainly, I know the the work on the left is full of controversy, uh, and. Um, is is part of many other discussions. Uh, the fact that we're in that discussion, that 
the fact that you know and I, I say we as a discipline and here I invite myself to be part of your discussion which you, you may <laughs> invite me not to be part of but I I've come back here to try to see whether I can join it again after uh, probably too many years away looking at it from a distance but I think it's profoundly important that architects are part of the discussion about how we're building the future and uh, if we can still build some infrastructure along with some uh, some star architecture uh, all the better thank you very much yeah uh, thanks a lot uh, if there are any questions um, from the audience we can take a couple of them hi uh, thank you very much that was a really interesting uh, talk I had a question uh, about the basic framework with which you've approached this material uh, you've referred to a lot of binaries. You're using regional and national, traditional and modern. Uh, but the examples you showed quite clearly sort of conflate these categories. Uh, how do we, we it's, it's not, you can't look at a national as a accumulation of a number of regionals. Neither can you look at traditional and modern in, like the cremation, the act of cremation is very much part of our contemporary life. So it's not necessarily tradition as rooted in the past. So I was just wondering, how the, these binaries help us engage with a complex situation and maybe why you choose to, because even your preface starts with India as a land of contrasts. So uh, uh, how, why the use of binaries and uh, can one transcend that and if we do then where does it leave us? All right, well that's a, that's a, a great question of our time and uh, I have been part of that generation that has been incessantly asking versions of that question and drawing our attention of our students to say well you know we we are prone to think in these binaries how can we get beyond them this that's what you're asking um i guess in in putting them as they do in the very first paragraph it's to sort of say this is what people say yeah, our ambition is to get beyond them um and i hope what i'm was saying with this with this previous image is i i, I i'm saying that the we're saying that the the, the crematorium for us is is not one or the other. Um, it's 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 architecture. Um, it's 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 more than that. Um, we we haven't talked so much about tradition in the way that I think you were implying as a sort of binary opposite to modernity. That was the that was the the binary that really dominated the discussion 20 years ago. Uh, and I, I I hope we haven't. I hope that doesn't come out against what I'm saying <laughs> when one does a kind of a a, a, a discourse analysis of the text and finds out how many times I mentioned tradition. But I, I think uh, we were trying to find ways to say uh, in our setup here where I say we could look at the, the, the mid 20th century as this or that, but if we look at seriously at the 70s and what that was politically and socially, it was a muddy period where it, you couldn't really say it was you know in this camp or that camp. It, it, it did some really weird and fascinating things uh, in the in the in the in the social and political process, which uh, were were reflected and contributed to in important ways in the in the architectural uh, world, and again, this school was a place where a lot of that work and th and type of thinking happened. Um, where when you, when we look at the discourse, and this is what we hope we've done in this book, really better than others were able to do, uh, because we've had the time to crack open some of the, the resources. We've had the, the awareness through some other preliminary work that this, this way of looking might actually be fruitful. When we look at the discourses, it, we can look at, in the, say, the journals, uh, in, the, in the papers, uh, in, in, if, you, if you track, for instance, what, what Korea said uh, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in, in, in subsequent articles, uh, that brilliant man was sort of up and uh, was here and there and everywhere and, and contradicting himself. Uh, if you want to take that sort of dismissive, simplistic sort of binary thing, saying, "Oh, he said this and then he said that," he's a hypocrite. You know, throw him away. No, he he was he was working with history and and thinking uh, in the context about where, as a leader, he might inspire his colleagues or provoke his colleagues to go. And I think uh, we've hopefully done that with a number of the key voices and found others that we haven't heard before who are part of that discussion that uh, really tell us that, you know, these, these, these never resolve into those simple things. So, for instance, the, uh, the seminar in 1959 that uh, is often referred to and many people in the room might have 
seen, maybe not seen this document, but heard, seen reference to it. There was this first important conference uh, sym symposium organized in Delhi in 1959 where uh, it seems like most of the, the players of the time were together in the same room for the first time. And they they tried to have this this discussion over a number of days about what really mattered. And it's fascinating to see you know, how they didn't, couldn't agree, and, but how they came out very emphatically even then against taking up simplistic uh, oppositions. You know, revivalism wasn't just something to be thrown away. Modernism wasn't just being functional. It was, you know, it was a complicated business. So uh, that's my complicated answer to your question. Uh. Thank you. Uh, the framework that you offered at the end is uh, it's quite refreshing and in fact brilliant, uh, which is trying to understand uh, the history as a swing, like a pendulum between the rhetorical and the rationalizing. And probably what one seeks is a kind of a Zen-like stillness at the middle. Having said that, however, your presentation was actually not that, I ask you. I mean, I understand. It's basically the construction of the center and how you counterpose to that consciously or otherwise is what comes through in the presentation. That's my comment. But my question is, in the construction of the center, which is, uh, which I assume is the daily centric, which is essentially uh, bureaucratic, centralized, symbolic, high on the rhetoric, that's how you characterize the center. But I ask, probably it would be, I don't know whether we would consider constructing this idea of both the nation and the center, not as a center, but as centers, because Bombay was also equally center, which is exactly what not uh, Delhi was, which is basically commercial, enterprising, open and flexible, which also simultaneously existed. In fact, it's even more older a center for architecture. So, so if you were to expand that framework, then probably this question of uh, locating Ahmedabad as a counterpoint may not really exist. So we could see this old development coming from two fountainheads rather than a single fountainhead. Well, well <clears throat> first I'm assuming that's not a question, it's a very insightful comment, which of course we want to take on as we continue to look at this further. But um, the relationship of Ahmedabad and Mumbai is an important one and we particularly look at the the, the context of the, the larger Bombay state and, and the, the post-independence sort of struggle that was happening and the establishment of Ahmedabad. So uh, I think of course in a short presentation it probably comes around that we are talking about the center as this sort of uh, at Delhi which is far removed from Ahmedabad. But the regional stories are the way we are trying to present as part of these developments that we are happening where we're starting to see the regional connections overseas as well. That's probably what we were trying to focus on, particularly in Ahmedabad's case with the arrival of larger institutional buildings, in sorry, institutions in terms of uh, the patronage of the regional elite. So I think that's mostly how we characterize that as a region, uh, not in terms of an opposition to Delhi as such. And of course, uh, in that same slide, we had the Ford Foundation building in Delhi. So we talk about Delhi as a region as well. So hopefully some of that would get covered in the way it is presented in the book. Yeah. The, the, uh, the frontis image for the chapter that introduces the, uh, the, the mid 20th century you know, regionalist slash institution building endeavors, uh, we, we chose to, to illustrate the the, uh, the Marine Drive in, in, in Mumbai. So it, um, that the, the publisher liked the image there uh, best and various things, but uh, I might say, oh yeah, you know, we were right there, so you were there saying, well, of course it was the, the commercial center. I mean, that's actually an older argument uh, that, that, that even Vikram Bhatt and I you know, entertained uh, or saw uh, in choosing to, to, to make a chapter about the, the market as it was just becoming something we were talking about and looking at hotels and Hafiz Contractor and his earliest work and such like that back then. Um, we of course deal with that ag again, but I think looking at the, at the patronage in that more complex level, where yes, it's in it's in it's industrialists, it's financiers, it's the Tatas. Many you know they they probably feature in our index 
many, many times, um, and others, the Birlas, the Modis, and such. Uh, they they are a, a driving force, undoubtedly, but their 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 engagement beyond mere commerce or finance in as 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 cultural czars as 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 um, as uh, power figures who are attracting the attention of the Ford Foundation and and other benefactors who are interested in in lateral players who who, who can do interesting uh, non central based stuff in in a context of the Cold War where where the center is drifting you know to the other side or to non aligned positions which are are intractable to is to influence at the center is, is another sort of dimension of the story which we try to open up. I mean, it's, it's something that really merits a lot more scholarship, I think, that we couldn't possibly provide in depth in our book, but uh, it's an invitation to, to really think more about these things. Thanks. Thank you for this extensive study. Uh, my question is more about the time. Um, uh, over so many years of architecture which you have been looking at in India, what, what have been your comments about the role of the architect in the socio-political context? Because once there was a city architect or there was a position for a city engineer and uh, now the role or the position of the architect is not quite clear if I might just put it like that. And how, how has that informed such a study? Uh, to be frank, I don't think I have a, a, an answer to that. What I, what I think we have done is, is, is uh, fold into this history a, a lot more of the scholarship, my own, and, and I have to emphasize many other um, uh, key people, some of whom are graduates of SEPT, who've gone off and, you know, as you know, have brilliant careers, uh, writing really brilliant stuff in other universities who, who produced these monographic or these, 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 these micro-historical studies of cities, particularly, uh, where we, we know much better the history of Calcutta and, and, uh, and Mumbai, Bombay, and, and Lahore, which is a really fascinating case outside the the, the envelope of modern India, but we include it because it's part of colonial modern India. Um, and you say Will Glover's work on Lahore tells us a whole lot about this, 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 the, the power of, of uh, architects both within and outside uh, the, the system at the very nascent early period of, of, of modern institution building in, in that uh, you know, seemingly remote but very important center in the northwest of the, of the region. Uh, so we brought that scholarship into the into the storyline, uh, and uh, hopefully this this will enable uh, you to find answers to the question you're asking and, and realize where a lot more work needs to be done. And I think it's an extremely important question. Uh, again, and that's part of my encouragement to us for us to all think with the benefit of of improving uh, access to, to historical materials and, and, a, and a thicker, richer, and more critical view at, our, at, at the past, how we can address the question of agency in, in the present and, and the role that, the, that the, the architectural discipline can have in, in, in really shaping cities, among other large things. Any more questions? <coughs> okay, I'd like to invite Dr. Neil Patel, the president of SEPT University, to give a vote of thanks and a small moment on behalf of SEPT. When I walked in, Kashi said that uh, there are many alums here, but there's nobody from the FAAA. So will you do the vote of thanks, please? So here I am. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this study and this talk and coming here. Um, it, I think it's extremely important in the, uh, that, that we try and understand what happened in the previous century in India, in Indian architecture, because that's a way of knowing about India and that's a way of, of, of finding out what is possible in the years to come. So it's very important endeavor. I think you were saying before the talk that it's. I think that that 
lot of we are suddenly seeing a lot of different studies um, emerging. Um, we are seeing, you know, there's the Linde's book coming out maybe tomorrow. Sabi Brehman's book coming out. I just saw a wonderful small study on Otto Konisberger uh, that somebody's done. Um, there's, you know, lots of different people. It's your book. There's there's lots of different people interrogating what happened in the previous century and I guess that's not very surprising because um, we really tr are trying to figure out where Indian architecture ought to be going over the coming century and it's, this is this really important work that you're doing. Thank you very much for coming and um, yep. Yeah. On behalf of SEPT yeah, and FT please. Thank you once again, Peter and Amit, and thanks everyone for attending the talk.